we can start the live stream. So first of all, uh, I'm Janet Jacobson. I am co-director this year of the Barnard Center for Research on Women with our good colleague, Pamela Nadison. And I cannot tell you how happy I am uh, to be in this room with you and to be live streaming at the same time uh, with the audience that uh, the center under the leadership of our colleague Elizabeth Costelli uh, to continue to reach the audience that uh, the center developed over the time of the pandemic. Um, this is a reunion in so many ways. As many of you know, I was director of BCRW for many years, I stepped away and have come back just uh, to join in the fun uh, for this one year. And um, this is also a project that is a long time in coming. And uh, we, are, we are part of a group of co-authors, I'll tell you more in a minute, uh, that met together for five years and then wrote a book together, literally together in small groups for three, and then the pandemic happened. Uh, so for us to be together is also just an amazing thing. And then to get to be together uh, with you, our colleagues, our students, um, and a larger audience, we're just really deeply grateful uh, to be able to join you. Um, so first, a few announcements. Um, and uh, I would like to make my phone work, which would be really good. Uh, it's not my best thing. All right, a few announcements, starting with thank yous, for which there are many that we should be in the room together right now. Uh, first, we have uh, to my right, uh, uh, all hands in motion, Mark Weisberg, yes? Um, Rice, Rice Glass, sorry, it's cut off on my phone. Mark Weiss Glass from All Hands in Motion is doing ASL interpreting, um, and we will also have captioning from Total Caption. This event is co-sponsored by our good colleagues um, in the Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies, um, many of whom participated in the initial workshop uh, that set off this project, including uh, Nefertiti Tadiar. Um, so thank you to them. Uh, we want to thank IMATS, who um, we've been working with to figure out how we could manage uh, to do the live stream and, and um, do this at the same time. And we believe that this is going to be glitch free, but uh, if, if it's not, it's all on us, <laughs> on me. So um, thank you to July Brown, Rosanna Chang, Jess Saldana, and Rachel James. Our photographer this evening is Matt Harvey, who has also been here all day uh, filming new videos on neoliberalism. Some of you have seen our videos online on this issue. Um, and uh, so thank you to Matt. Um, the BCRW staff as a whole has been deeply involved. Premla Nadison, Hope Dector, Sophie Kreitzberg, Pamela Phillips, Miriam Neptune, and Avi Cummings. I also want to announce a couple of upcoming BCRW events. These are all in person. Um, the first is on Thursday um, in the event oval, we will have a celebration of the Entosaki Sange, Sange residency which is a collaboration among the BCRW, the Public Theater, and the um, Shanghai Literary Trust. And it is in celebration of uh, the first holder of the artist in residence um, position, playwright Erica Dickerson Dispenza. Um, and we will have basically an evening that will include uh, performances um, by uh, Shange's collaborators, as well as by uh, Barnard alum, who was influenced by the work that's been done over the years here um, in honoring and documenting uh, Shange's work, um, and toasts to everyone who made this possible, most especially the previous director of BCRW, Elizabeth Costelli. So please join us next Thursday for a celebration of the residency. And then our Helen Pond McIntyre lecture will take place the following week on October 19th, um, and Donna Ayn Davis will speak about reproductive injustice, uh, Professor Davis's book, in conjunction with our colleague at Columbia, Sarah Haley. Uh, this is a, an event that was planned before the pandemic that we're able to bring back to you, and of course it has become all the more relevant uh, in the current moment. So please join us on October 19th for the McIntyre lecture. So, um, as I mentioned, this is a collaboration um, that was 10 years in the making and that was actually longer than that because it's based on several BCRW projects related to economic justice that we undertook um, over the past 15 years. And those included um, a project with the National Domestic Workers Alliance in the US that included our not yet colleague, uh, Pramila Madison. I like to think that we seduced you uh, by 
doing that project on um, domestic work. It included a workshop and a report and issue of the Web Journal Scholar and Feminist Online with, uh, that was led by Kate Bedford um, on sexual and economic justice. Um, and it included a project done with the activist Amber Hollibaugh on queer survival economies, which led us to a workshop in 2012 um, on the meaning of neoliberalism that was part of a project on transnational feminisms at BCRW that continues on to this day. So we were able to move into the existing project on transnational feminisms and are very happy to be able to celebrate this book as a result of it and look forward to the productions of that project uh, in the years to come. Um, what we were trying to do was shift understandings about how we think about the transnational and in the working group that developed out of this project, which involved 12 scholars working in different areas of the world, what we were interested in was could we think about something like the current political economy, which we understood through um, the name neoliberalism, in ways that would not simply either try to synthesize something into a global systemic analysis, nor would it simply leave the local as a site for individual or comparative analysis in the usual anthology form where you would have a chapter on each place that would present the research of uh, each scholar. But rather, we ambitiously and perhaps foolishly set out to try to talk to each other over a five-year period of time so as to synthesize our work together. And it included an opening workshop, again, in which our colleagues here participated and many other people. It included um, conferences along the way in which additional colleagues contributed. So it was a very wide-ranging project. Um, and then we wrote the chapters together. So the chapters include the individual research of each of the contributors, but they do not, um, uh, but they're synthetic chapters, right? So they pull together knowledge uh, rather than simply leaving it either at the systems global level or at the local um, particular level. Um, and that did change, we believe, that shift in method changed um, some of what we thought um, in terms of what neoliberalism is. We came to understand it as not something that could be easily defined, that there was no single definition, but rather that it was a bundle of policies and practices that shifted over time in various ways, and we're gonna talk about that, and specifically in ways that were paradoxical, and yet often or almost always to the same effect, what Lisa Dugan has called redistribution upwards intensifying inequality, intensifying precarity, continuations of ongoing um, hierarchies and dominations. And so that idea that there was a set of policies and practices that repeatedly produced this effect um, and that those effects tended to be paradoxical. And uh, Elizabeth Bernstein is gonna um, talk a little bit more about the book and explain what we mean by paradoxes and that's most of what we'll be talking about tonight. Um, and then there was one other really method, important methodological point, which was we came from many disciplines. We came from many different frameworks of thought. And what we came to understand was that these were frameworks that needed to come together. They were in a you know, social justice feminism sense intersectional, and yet they were also incommensurable. They could not simply be synthesized into a single approach. And so we did our best to hold things together that were both um, intersectional and incommensurable amongst a set of frameworks that will be familiar to many of you, racial capitalism, the ways in which capitalism itself was formed through um, racial formations and in particular um, enslavement and um, its connection then to ongoing coloniality um, and thinking about the ways in which um, anti-colonial movements have been important in many areas of the world that, that um, people were working in, uh, including Hong Kong and India, and yet at the same time, the effects of colonialism, and in some cases, coloniality itself continues. So that's something that uh, we will uh, also be talking about tonight. We connected that to social um, uh, reproduction theory and to the idea that all kinds of labor that are removed from many analyses, whether they're liberal analyses, Marxian analyses, and like, um, are nonetheless important to political economy and should be taken into account. Um, and at the same time, we also adopted a queer materialism, which is that there are also various ways in which people make their lives, in which they form 
households in which they form networks, relationships, um, and other types of relationality that don't reproduce the social, at least as it exists right now, that in fact mix up the social, they undo things, they make it queer. And so trying to hold those different perspectives together is, I think, again, one of the major methodological changes that this um, approach of doing synthetic work together uh, brought about. Um, so what we're here to do, do tonight is to talk about what we learned. Um, and uh, what we're going to do is, as I said, Elizabeth Bernstein, who is the lead um, uh, editor for all of our various uh, co-authoring, will tell you a little bit more about the specific insights. Uh, and then we're going to have a conversation with those of us who could join us tonight. So I will introduce them not quite yet. You can wait just a minute. I'm going to introduce everybody. <laughs> Uh, in, so Elizabeth there is at the end, Elizabeth Bernstein, as you all know, is the professor of women's gender and sexuality studies at Barnard and is the author of uh, not one but two award-winning books, Temporarily Yours, Intimacy, Authenticity, and the Commerce of Sex, the first, and then the second, Brokered Subjects, Sex, Trafficking, and the Politics of Freedom. Um, and many of you will also have read her essays, including um, the much taught one, Militarized Humanitarianism and Carceral Feminism in Signs, a Journal of Women in Culture and Society. Uh, next to Elizabeth is Mario Pacheni, who is Vice President of Scientific Affairs for Argentina's National Council of Scientific and Technical Research, and a professor and researcher at the University of Buenos Aires. He publishes extensively on gender, health, sexuality, and reproductive rights, and has been a visiting scholar at the University of Cape Town, South Africa, the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and other universities around the world, including perhaps Columbia, although it's not named here, so it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> next to Mario is Tammy Navarro, um, who is associate? Assistant. assistant, okay. Assistant Professor of Africana Studies at Drew University and the author of Virgin Capital, Race, Gender, and Financialization in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And you can find a video of that book, which was launched um, on the BCRW, uh, in a BCRW event um, and is on the BCRW YouTube channel because, as you all know, Tammy was previously the Associate Director of BCRW, and we are particularly happy to welcome her back this evening. Um, sitting next to uh, Tammy is Anna Amachastegui, who is Professor of Social Psychology um, at the Autonomous University of Mexico, who researches contemporary sexual politics and reproductive rights in Mexico, including an important study on women living with HIV that was the subject of um, uh, work that was shared in the book. And then finally, Kerwin Kay is Associate Professor of Feminist, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at Wesleyan University and the author of Enforcing Freedom, Drug Courts, Therapeutic Communities, and the Intimacies of the State. So thank you all for being here. Elizabeth Bernstein will now walk us through the book, and then we'll have some conversation. Eventually, we will have conversation with all of you. Hello. OK. Um, so uh, just a couple more thank yous before I delve into the content of the book. Um, thank you to the staff at BCRW for um, this um, adventure in uh, hybrid event planning. I know it's, um, uh, Sophie told me earlier, it's an experiment. We'll see how it goes, <laughs> so um, hopefully well. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Pramila. Um, thank you to all the panelists who made the journey here from um, quite far away. and. Um, I also want to thank our co-authors who I believe are live streaming from uh, various parts of the world. One of the things about doing a project with 12 co-authors um, in places like um, Hong Kong, different time zones, is that it's uh, 6 a.m. in the morning there. So anyway, so thanks, um, thanks to everybody who's joining us remotely as well. And thank you for being here. It's really um, a special, wonderful occasion. Okay. Um, as Janet mentioned, um, this project has a very long and complex genealogy, so I'm not going to go back over that, but um, what I'd like to do in just my few minutes tonight, um, by way of an introduction, is just to present in sort of um, very general contours some of the main themes of this book, uh, and then we're going to go into the dialogic part of the event. We're going to pose some questions to the panelists, uh, which we'll all answer, um, including myself and Janet, but um, I'm just going to start by introducing the broad themes. Okay, so. Let me just tell you um, what some of our central intentions were for this volume, um, three big takeaways that we hope that readers, students, activists can glean from this project. 
Okay, so the first, uh, the first of these pertains to the subtitle of our book, right? Um, Sex, Gender, and Possibilities for Justice, right? And um, what we're trying to do here, right, is not only understand neoliberalism, but understand its implications um, uh, with the things Janet mentioned, racial capitalism, social reproduction, um, but in particular, um, gender and sexual politics. And so what we tried to do in this volume, getting away from me, okay. What we tried to do in this volume was to demonstrate the ways in which sexuality and gender are not just epiphenomenal or superstructural to economic practices and material relations, um, but are themselves formative of broader social and political currents, um, even if this is not always acknowledged to be the case. So whether we're talking about gendered labor markets in both the formal and informal sectors, um, or if we're talking about the regulation of migration flows, which often rest upon assumptions of the ideal family form, although that's not acknowledged, right? Or if we're talking about the gendered underpinnings and implications of welfare state retrenchment, or the gendered presumptions behind border control and the security state, gender and sexuality we need to recognize are fundamental to social organization. Okay, second contribution that we hope that this book would make concerns the question of what neoliberalism is and how best to study it. And Janet touched upon this, so I wanna just add a few more things. So after years of discussions across temporal and spatial contexts, Janet mentioned this, right? And we debated, for example, is neoliberalism even still the best term? Um, you know, if it is, uh, how do we think about it synthetically across these cases? Um, we decided it was, by the way, but <laughs> we'll get more, I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, and, 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 you know, and if so, if it is the best term um, to, to use to understand the various cases we were looking at, um, what are its central features? You know, for example, uh, one of our co-authors, Seeling Chang, writes about the fact that, you know, in South Korea, neoliberalism uh, is not opposed to de de uh, democratization, but goes hand in hand with it, right? So a different feature than in the United States, for example, right? So one of the things that we were trying to... Um, uh, to figure out working collectively and synthetically um, is how to hold these different aspects of neoliberalism together. And we came up um, with a, a, you know, a sort of working definition that posited it as a paradoxical assemblage of policies, practices, and affects that make up uh, contemporary hegemony. Right? And what's needed, we argue in the book, is a view of the multiple relations and flows that serve to link different local formations as well as different political forms within particular localities, right? So now this brings us back to the question of method that Janet also touched upon. Now, um, indeed, our method was highly experimental, um, and many of us were trained as like conventional social scientists, so this was like really wild for us to do this, um, uh, but, but um, we forged ahead. Um, and so, you know, as Janet mentioned, we came, you know, um, come from different places, we did work in different parts of the global south and the global north, um, but we, what we were trying to do methodologically was not just um, to do something that anthropologists, sociologists have done uh, before, which is, you know, looking at the impact of the global on the local or the global, right? And it's not that we're not interested in that. We, we are and we were, um, and, and, but also in something beyond that. And nor were we simply trying to look at vernacularized versions of neoliberalism. And again, that is interesting to us too. Um, but rather what we were interested in was sort of the nodal points, right? How um, neoliberalism can be manifest through different policies and practices in different places and how they connect to one another. And for, I'll just give you, you know, one example from another one of our co-authors uh, who couldn't be here tonight, Mark Padilla, who writes about sort of the ways in which the war on drugs in the United States intersects, touches up against, and produces um, investment in tourist economies in the Dominican Republic, right? So it's these points of connections that we could only see if we were working together and synthetically, right? So, so what we wanted to try and find out sort of through mutual dialogue, mutual writing, was the, you know, what, it, what, it, what is it that binds these distinct policies and practices, right, towards common material and affective ends, right? Such that the upward redistribution of wealth and the personal responsibilization um, for collective welfare seem to always be the outcome, right? Now, each chapter of the book uh, is co-authored, as Janet mentioned, right? Working in different parts. It's co-authored by researchers working in different parts of the world, right? And so, uh, you know, we were uh, in a position then to really spend time on the spaces of intersection and points of contact. And I think that, um, as in the instance I just described from Mark's work, I think 
uh, Mark's work in connection with all of our conversations, that's one of the things that this book can contribute, right? So in a sense, looking at the movement, right, the transnational uh, flow of policies, practices, um, hegemonic constructions, et cetera, right? The transmutation of these policies and practices over the course of that movement, right? And then how they congeal in particular places in particular ways uh, in particular historical moments, right? Okay, so now this brings us to the third intervention, right? Which is um, historic, one of uh, considering the historical specificity of the present, right? And how best to think about it. Um, and this problem became a particularly vexing one for us over the course of the many years of our writing, right? So we began our work as a research collective in 2012. Um, by the time we were finishing, Trump had been elected president in the United States. There were authoritarian figures such as Bolsonaro in Brazil, Orban in Hungary, Le Pen in France um, were ascending in many parts of the world, right? And there, were, well, there was sort of increasing talk among some social commentators that, you know, the era of neoliberalism was maybe over and, uh, and maybe we needed a new name or a new term um, to describe this new political formation uh, that was taking shape. And, uh, and we decided, as, as we were writing the introduction to this book and we going over the chapters again, should we change the title <laughs> at the 11th hour? Um, no, that, so basically that, you know, our, our position is different, right? So for us, we, we um, follow the analysis of Sarah Berger Bush, uh, who came, who's written about this period instead as one of nationalist neoliberalism, right? In which key elements of neoliberal hegemony remain in place, even as others have shifted, right? And so, in fact, the continued utility of neoliberalism as an interpretive schema uh, to understand the current, uh, current hegemonic formations um, became all the more apparent to us during the in initial months of the pandemic when we were finishing up the book. Um, and it also, I think, became more evident just how paradoxical uh, this moment um, was and, um, and how paradoxical the formations we were looking at were as well, right? And, the, and I think these paradoxes were revealed in especially clear ways, right, during, during these moments of crisis, right? So let me just provide um, a couple of examples of some of the paradoxes that we write about in the introduction, uh, and then I'm gonna turn the floor over to my colleagues to fill in some of the details from their own research and writing. Okay, so, so, so here's a couple, right? So just thinking back to 2020, right? So first of all, if you remember, you know, we have the designation of certain modes of labor uh, as essential, not just in the United States, but um, many parts of the world that we, we were all following. Um, while at the same time, the workers in question who were disproportionately black and brown, migrants and female, were treated as disposable, right? paradox one. Paradox two, while vast numbers of people became unemployed and faced conditions of food insecurity, the upper tiers of the population, both across and within nation states, amassed unprecedented wealth. Um, and this is not even to mention the astounding profits of certain elements of the corporate sector, um, profits made by companies like Pfizer. Um, I think they make $65,000 every minute. So as it, since I've been speaking, somebody do the math, seven minutes, how much money, um, or $34 billion a year, right? Um, third paradox, even with much of the population confined to the home, in which the importance of caring labor became visible as never before, there were very few public provisions for domestic work or childcare. So with these examples, I think we can see some of the paradoxical features of neoliberalism that have continued to structure the very recent past and how they remain deep, deeply implicated with race, class, gender, uh, and other social inequalities. And I think this continues to be um, probably even more true in the so-called post-pandemic landscape with the push to the return to normal. Um, well, four to 400 or 500 people a day uh, continue to die just in the United States. Um, and so with that, I would like to open up the floor to my colleagues um, by presenting them with our first questions. Okay, everybody ready? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll take that as a yes. Right? <laughs> All right, so the first question, all right, you've all seen the questions, you should be right. The first question has to do with some of the changes, um, the very recent changes that I was just referencing, um, and I'm hoping that you can all elaborate on this from the perspective of your own thinking and research. So, um, you know, we began working on this project um, together a decade ago, and the United States, as I mentioned, Obama was president. Um, we hadn't even seen Trump or the rise of other far-right leaders yet. 
uh, and the COVID-19 pandemic had not yet happened, right? So I'm wondering if you can speak to what's changed in the parts of the globe that you work on, right? And how broader political economic changes have intersected with shifting politics of sex and gender in those contexts. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah. All right, Mario, do you wanna start for us? And then we'll just ask everybody to go in turn um, on this first question. Hello. Well, first of all, thank uh, Janet and thanks Elizabeth and Bernard and all my colleagues to allow me to be a part of your team. Uh, you know these those questions are impossible to answer, but uh, the idea that we we have today after three four years of uh, after the the fi finishing the book and the writing is that the COVID nineteen and other phenomena. Uh, exacerbated one, uh, the features, the paradoxical uh, ca character or nature of neoliberal consequences and uh, what I would call a radical uncertainty that is related to neoliberalism. Uh, by radical uncertainty, I mean uh, that we have lost uh, the parameters, the point of reference uh, that make uh, people ourselves to feel that we have a place in the world. I will speak very uh, schematically, but uh, after two or three, four decades of uh, realizing that the illusion of inclusion uh, uh, through work and through the job market, uh, it, even if it was an illusion and even if it was true for a small part of the population, but this very idea is now uh, something that is not uh, credible anymore. And at the same time, we have the radical uncertainty uh, related to the destruction, we hope the destruction, of gender hierarchies and generation hierarchies and racial hierarchies. So this idea that we had a social order that made life meaningful is not there anymore. And at the same time, the COVID uh, not only uh, showed that some people might be considered superfluous, that is, they don't have a place in this world. There's not a place for all of us. The COVID-19 uh, sh showed in my country, for example, that it was a literal discussion. Which generation is disposable? This fake uh, dilemma between economy versus health, and that meant uh, there are some individuals and some groups that might not have a place in this world. So, uh, just to, to finish this little not modest introduction, is that uh, what we witnessed is that the consequences of neoliberal policies in Latin America, but elsewhere, produce an anti-liberal reaction. That is a reaction against the liberal component of neoliberalism uh, that put us in the situation to defend, you know, those kind of 19th or 18th century values of rule of law, uh, institutional democracy, the traditional political parties, just to put us in a conservative situation of defending these very basic uh, values or principles facing those very fascist and authoritarian and reactionary, not only conservative, because they want to go back to an illusional order uh, from the past that might have never existed, but uh, put um, several countries in the world, in the regions, several regions of the world, facing, you know, uh, explicit authoritarian and exclusionary regimes and political parties and discourses, supported but not uh, so minority parts of the population. All right, that was a good start. Tammy, do you wanna? Uh, Hi. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you to everyone. It is amazing and bizarre to be back together after, one thing that I don't think was said was we actually traveled the world together um, and very, visited various research sites. So it's wonderful to be part of this culminating event. So thank you. Um, I just wanna say two things about this question. The first is really to echo what Elizabeth was saying about the, not the rise in care work, but the more immediate appearance of care work, the way it, had, it was sort of brought to the fore um, and engaged with 
particular, I just, I guess I want to emphasize what you said, particularly for women of color. Um, and in my work, I work in a U.S. territory, uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands. I think it brought to the fore question, uh, questions about what it means to be a disposable person within a disposable region, right? So it's a place that has always sort of been a, a space of experimentation. I was talking earlier about, um, you know, the United States, Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico have always, always served as a sort of space of let's see what's going to happen. My work explores that in the realm of, of the financial, right? Let's sort of try this um, infusion of, of capital. Um, but we've seen this in the realm of the environmental. I'm thinking here of um, the U.S. Navy bombings in Vieques, which continue to have um, horrific and deleterious effects on the environment and the health of the people that live in those areas. Um, so what it means to just be yeah, a disposable person in an already disposable space. I think that COVID did not create those issues, but certainly exacerbated them and made them um, much more difficult to ignore. Um, the second thing I wanna say, uh, thinking about my work in the Caribbean is the ways that COVID-19 and the changes we've seen in the last decade have really um, made issues of coloniality more clear for those that have not been paying attention, right? So I work in this area, but thinking through COVID, the ways that um, it really produced almost the, ent the entire disappearance of um, tourist economies across the entire region, right? People couldn't travel. What did that mean for economies that were made and almost entirely dependent on tourist dollars, right? So we have this sort of gutting of the economic at the same time that we had increased vulnerability <clears throat> around public health, right? So for spaces like the US Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, they did not have the ability to do things like close their borders because there are none, right? What does it mean to be a possession um, and to have your borders extend um, to the mainland US, right? So as spikes would happen, there was really no political, there was, sorry, there was actually no um, logistical re recourse to do things like close borders or think about airports or limiting flights um, from areas that were currently spiking, right? So when you are a possession of the United States and you are the United States, what does it mean about your ability um, to stay safe and to have your vulnerability mitigated in some ways. So, yeah, that's what I'll say. Ah. Uh, hi. Hello. From Mexico, I'm extremely happy to be with friends and colleagues and people who have um, actually changed not only the way I think, but the way I feel about research and academic work and how, it, how it's important to um, uh, to become engaged with what we are doing, and not only intellectually, but also in terms of uh, affect and friendships. Um, I'm going to say a few things about what neoliberalism is talked about in Mexico today. In 2018, we had a new president that was coming supposedly from the left, Andres Manuel López Obrador, he didn't, he has never been a, an activist in the uh, leftist parties or anything like that, but he was like um, uh, supported by some part of the left in Mexico. And in 2019, Lopez Obrador declared neoliberalism to be dead. He declared, he, he just decreed, decreed? that neoliberalism was dead, but he was extremely specific as what he was talking about. Um, he wasn't very learned on the term, uh, but he decided that neoliberalism was every regime before his own, <laughs> especially the pre-regime, the, the old party uh, after the revolution uh, that stayed in power for 70 years and the right-wing party Partido Acción Nacional that had two president, presidencies before his, uh, everything, those were neoliberals. And he was um, what we would call, and we were discussing, he, we could call him a populist neoliberal. I'll, I'll explain why. But anyway, um, so neoliberalism became something even more shaky in Mexico because it used to be a critical term we used for making a critique of particular political economies and practices of powers. But now it's been appropriated by the government and by the president as a way of uh, defining 
who is the enemy. He calls about the new liberals as, as um, conservatives, which in a way he's right because of what you're saying, but he's talking about conservatives in terms of his policies, how um, the previous regimes and the people who were in previous regimes only want to conserve and maintain a particular practice that has to do with corruption. So for him, neoliberalism is the synonym of corruption, which he's not completely wrong, but at the same time, what, um, what he's, he, he, he shows us is that neoliberalism is today an empty signifier. It's actually a term that is uh, in a political dispute for hegemony. It's an ideological dispute that is now being appropriated by the government. And um, what this meant in terms of, uh, in practical terms, is that one of his first decisions in government was to defund all civil society organizations. There is no funding in Mexico for any civil society organization. And um, I, 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 just an autoethnographic note on this, it makes me feel so sad. And, I long so much for the possibilities of working with the women with HIV in the field in Mexico because we have no national funding anymore, not from the health secretary, nor, nor, nor from uh, the National Council on AIDS. And only those very, very um, well-trained, professionalized organizations, uh, feminist organizations may, mainly, are getting funding from abroad from somewhere else so that's that's the scenery that's the uh, the panorama in mexico and one more thing the the, the one of his uh, slogans has been the poor go first so he's done a whole lot of social programs which are actually actually focalized um, cash transfer and this has gone against the remains of the welfare state in Mexico City because there's no also no government agency who has that has enough funding for doing uh, work for the citizenry as we would call so I'll just let leave it there for now. Carwin. Hello um, I also want to thank BCRW and um, for all the work organizing this event and through the years um, that Elizabeth and Janet both uh, really organized a lot and I'm very excited to be here tonight to get to, to share um, time with people who I've spent a number of years now um, uh, spending time with in, in, in fun and productive ways and um, especially Tammy and Anna who got to co-author our chapter, so thank you. Um, uh, thinking about what's happened since Barack Obama <laughs> was in office, which seems so long ago, um, you know, I, I agree with some of the, uh, the the formulations that have been put forward. And you know, the area that I was working in most was the U.S. Um, around issues of sex work, um, secondarily around drug use. And um, so the U.S., of course, I think we've seen this great challenge to sort of a neoliberal multiculturalism with Obama uh, toward uh, neoliberal populism or neoliberal nationalism, we could call it, uh, but uh, a, a neoliberal populism with Trump. And these being two uh, efforts at creating a hegemonic uh, coalition uh, that can dominate, but I, I think there is enough um, uh, of, a co of a core in both instances, um, it, just in terms of the basic capitalist formulation, um, that we could we could speak of some continuities between both both of these uh, formations. Um, with with what's happening around. Um, sex work in the, in the U.S. through this time and through uh, COVID. You know, I think it's been another area where people have been defined as disposable and the work itself is completely invisible. 
and um, thought of as best kept, sort of predisposed um, already in the trash bin, um, as it were. So um, many people then were pressed to the internet um, to, to continue work um, as best they could. So um, actually, I think what COVID facilitated was some uptake into an area where uh, these more corporate um, formations were able to capture some of their uh, their labor and and um, you know de uh, more individualized the work in some ways um, because in some ways sex workers had more control uh, through working with the internet but in other ways um, lost control and and facilitated sort of these more corporate types of hierarchies um, as as part of that so um, uh, to the extent that people were able to continue. Um, I think in general though, the, the, the fight between neoliberal multiculturalism and neoliberal populism, at least in the US context, has sort of uh, obscured the way in which there's this sort of professionalized sector which maybe was decimated somewhat in, in Mexico. But in the US, there's uh, the NGO sector and large parts of sort of the neoliberal bureaucracies of, of governance um, have continued unchanged, relatively unchanged, um, and such that uh, you know there's still uh, you know I see uh, a lot of areas in terms of how the criminal justice system is organized uh, or how um, even as the the um, even at the, I'm thinking of things at the border, even as that became spectacularized and Trump did a lot of things to spectacularize that, there were a lot of ways that, you know, as people, many critics pointed out, he was doing a lot of things that were already in process under Obama, things that Biden has continued and so on. And so there's a lot of ways in which sort of this uh, deep state, to use the right wing term, but the, the governing bureaucracies have, have continued and chugged along and, um, so even as there have been a lot of things that have changed and this fight between neoliberal multiculturalism and, and neoliberal populism is, is very much sort of at the forefront of a lot of the um, overtly political um, voting situations that we're dealing with, um, there's a lot of politics that have just sort of plugged along um, in, in a lot of distressing ways that I think we need to also pay attention to. Great, thank you. So um, our next question is going to be on paradoxes, specifically on the chapters, like vulnerability. Um, and, you know, I think that Anna has named very clearly how these paradoxes work. So you can come into uh, the presidency of Mexico as uh, supposedly from the left and as a populist and defund any support for uh, people living with AIDS, right? It's those kinds of uh, paradoxes that we are trying to look at throughout the book, and many of the individual chapters address them. So one of them with Tammy, Anna, Kerwin, and our colleague here at Barnard, Albuceti George, was focused on um, questions of vulnerability and what it meant that um, there is a lot of focus on increased vulnerability that is supposed to be ameliorative and yet seems to end up intensifying the very things that it names. So uh, Tammy, you want to go first on that one? Absolutely, yeah. Um, yes, so in my field site in the US Virgin Islands, um, the program that I study, the Economic Development Commission, the focus of my recent book, uh, was really sold to the people of the Virgin Islands as uh, the sort of saving grace of a long struggling economy, right? So this is not new for people who think about sort of paradigmatic development um, thinking over time. So uh, the Caribbean and Latin America has gone through these stages. Um, so this comes out of this kind of moment of industrialization and, and realizing some of the shortcomings um, of this model, right? Both environmental um, and on what would be called the human capital, right? Uh, the people of the region. Um, and so there's really been the shift toward financialization of which um, the project I study is an example. I give you the, that backstory to, to say that it was, it was sold to the people of the Virgin Isles as a way to integrate um, a really long struggling economy into transnational financial economic flows, right? So no longer are you gonna be sort of the periphery right, in relation to these sorts of core, um, but you're gonna become integral to these financial flows and transfers. 
Um, what ended up happening is exactly the opposite, right? So what ends up happening is there are all these um, financial management entities uh, that straddle the line between licit and illicit, um, and they come in and there's this infusion of foreign capital, of American capital, and with the capital come these wealthy financiers, right? Um, and so they build up these precarious hierarchies as people try to court this capital and sort of curry favor, uh, get jobs within this industry, right? So sort of get a grab of some of this money while it's on the ground. Um, but then the question becomes, as I saw during my field work in 2008, what happens when all too often it's pulled away quickly, right? And we've seen this. Um, it's been called screwdriver industries. Um, they've been, uh, Helen Safa has talked about this, right? So when it when a crisis happens, right, when there's a, an economic contraction, let's call it, and the market collapses in the U.S., well, then the vulnerability of its territories has only been increased, right, that the exposure of the territories um, is much more, right? So that the idea that you're going to minimize um, their vulnerability, right, you're not going to be in this sort of precarious economic position because you're going to be more closely tethered to the sort of America. You're going to have all this money lying around. Um, in fact, it... it increases the vulnerability um, exponentially, right? So what happened is a number of these firms left really quickly um, and the on the ground reality was that people had worked and they didn't receive paychecks for work they had performed. They weren't eligible for unemployment because of the kind of quasi um, legal way a lot of these entities were set up, right? The tax holidays extended in ways such that they weren't uh, required to pay into employee funds, right? So people were really left high and dry. Um, so when I think about questions of vulnerability, it's clear to me that programs like the one I study, and I should just say it's but an instance of a sort of larger uh, approach to thinking about um, these disposable spaces, um, it's clear to me that vulnerability is the ground upon which these programs are built, right? You have the space, you're going to do something with them, and then um, from that starting point, uh, it becomes increasingly um, a case of not just individual workers, but sort of a collective um, increase in vulnerability as we think about um, what is the kind of collective bargaining power, right, that workers have in relation to, com to companies and entities that have just disappeared, right? There are no claims uh, to be made, so, yeah. Kerwin or Anna, do you want to jump in here? Kerwin? Yes, tonight is about sharing and communal activity, not individual mics. So, um, a lot of what we wanted to take a look at in this chapter on vulnerability was the way that neoliberalism deploys tropes of vulnerability in order to advance its causes in a lot of ways, like what you were referencing, as well as ways that it then um, uh, exacerbates actual precarities, you know, so we wanted to sort of make some distinctions between these representations of vulnerability as well as the um, the actual material precarities that then get produced and how the representations of precarity can actually help facilitate the production of those material precarities. Um, so partly we were drawing on these uh, work of Didier Fasson on human humanitarianism and ways in which these sort of um, softer styles of representing sort of the neoliberal um, governance as a, as a way to uh, extend humanitarian benevolence to people in need, um, what that does is, is, you know, obscures the ways that those neoliberal structures often, you know, generally created um, that precarity to begin with, but, uh, but also then obscures the way that um, positioning somebody as vulnerable and in need of, of humanitarian rescue positions them as outside of the, the domain of rights, as outside of the domain of citizenship, and outside of the domain of politics, and where humanitarianism becomes sort of a voluntary gesture of benevolence. And uh, and, and working in very uh, gendered and sexed ways. So the humanitarian uh, recipient has to demonstrate their moral worth through these gendered and sexed ways. And so, um, so it, what it does is it, it is enables the state to play the role of, of the sort of good guy rescuer 
um, coming to save the day uh, when in fact uh, that those are the same structures that have produced the problem in the first place and, and that the, the terms under which aid is offered um, are further marginalizing and, and create further, further problems. Um, again, my own work uh, in the book was focused on sex trafficking and um, so, uh, you know, very much looking at these formations of uh, what Elizabeth Bernstein coined uh, uh, carceral feminism, uh, or James Kilgore has a term car uh, carceral humanitarianism, uh, sort of looking at ways in which the criminal justice system can get positioned as something that is beneficial uh, and can rescue people, uh, rescue sex trafficking victims, or in the case of drug users, um, can offer uh, forced treatment, coerced treatment, but you know, treatment instead of um, instead of incarceration, but always with incarceration there, and the conditions of treatment are themselves uh, a form of incarceration. So the so the trick to this uh, is to define harm in such a way that uh, that the the state is never or other governing structures are never envisioned as the causes of harm and are only positioned as um, the the form of salvation. Um, and so that means limiting and narrowing the types of harm that can be recognized and, and also um, envisioning one particular narrow path about what, uh, what the good life would be that's supposed to come out of that. And, and so that people who don't receive the aid in the proper way um, can be punished uh, and, and penalized, um, which is another way in which um, this sort of neoliberal project sort of takes humanitarianism and uses it in such a way that it can actually penalize people. Um, maybe I'll stop with that. Okay, good. Um, I'm gonna ask Anna and Elizabeth if they wanna jump in on the paradoxes question and then I'm gonna jump ahead so that we can get to the audience to uh, political power, building political oh, okay. power and start with Mario on that. So uh, do you wanna say anything more on paradoxes? Your initial answer on that was really no, beautiful. Ahead. So Elizabeth? Thank you. Um, so just uh, very briefly, just to add a, just a little bit to what uh, Kerwin was talking about in terms of um, um, the examples he just gave in which um, basically, you know, the, the remedies reproduce the problem in the first place. And so, you know, my own um, work that I've done with sex workers and with the discourse of trafficking and um, in recent years, you know, I think you gestured towards that, Kerwin, but I'll just, you know, if, if we think about this in, in the particular cases that I've worked on, I mean, it's really abundantly apparent, and, and several of us also um, worked in a chapter collectively in this book, so myself and Mario and um, Siling and Sina were looking at sort of the travels of the trafficking discourse, um, not just in the United States, but in Argentina and Nigeria and South Korea, all these very different contexts, and so, um, you know, on one hand, it was doing very different work in these different contexts. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, in the United States, it was fomenting what I called carceral feminism and militarized humanitarianism and redemptive capitalism. You know, in Argentina, Mario can talk about that. It was, um, you know, imagined as a, you know, post-transitional justice um, formation and, um, and Sealing and Sino were writing about sort of its role in sort of fomenting imaginations of the nation in their two cases. Um, in all of the cases though, there were some commonalities um, which had to do with criminal justice solutions, border control and rescue projects in which um, people who, um, you know, generally found themselves engaged in sex work to avoid other forms of low wage labor um, were shunted back into those very same forms of low wage labor in the first place. So talk about another paradox, right? So rescue programs for sex workers would train, um, you know, women often to make muffins for Starbucks or to serve drinks and food. And, uh, you know, people had these jobs in the first place and didn't like them. And so, um, uh, you know, that's, that's why they were engaged in sexual labor. So uh, I'll just throw that out. Yeah, so the chapters, as you can see, of the book move through several of the paradoxes, vulnerability, the travels of trafficking, the ways in which um, uh, discourses uh, come to uh, travel globally, come to different places, but end up doing um, specific work in each of those places. And there was also a chapter on migration, 
um, and that looked at the ways in which uh, the conditions of neoliberalism tended to induce and in many cases force migration while also intensifying and increasing border control and in increasing in regulation of internal migration as well as Fatih Shah's case in India was very much about people who traveled internally for labor and were variously um, both invisible, as we've said, and targeted by the state. Um, and so uh, the, the sense of the chapters moves through these important uh, paradoxes, vulnerability, uh, the travels and trafficking, migration, and then the final chapter is about building political power in such a paradoxical situation. Um, and that was a chapter that I wrote with Mario, Anna, and uh, our colleague, uh, Maya Horn. So Mario, do you wanna talk a little bit about building political power and then we'll open it up for all of you and by the end of the evening, we will um, have all of the answers and know exactly what to do. And just one comment that we use as you see the category of paradox, but also the concept of double bind to show these uh, contradictory experiences. And as the case of trafficking and sex worker discussions, we see as in different uh, situations that liberal discourse invites people or even force people to do things and even to be things, to be workers, students, lovers, to be loved, to form families, to be healthy, to uh, fight for your rights. For, uh, what, and at the same time, uh, the, uh, the agenda or the, the possibility to be heard and to be part of public policies, as Anna mentioned for the case of Mexico, uh, you can have access to the public uh, listening and to the public funds only in terms of victims. The victim is someone who doesn't speak, who doesn't act the opposite of those, that hyper-powerful subject that the neoliberal discourse wants you to be, to, to take care of your loved, loved ones, etc. So, uh, just to give you one little sample example in relation to what uh, Elizabeth have just said, uh, during COVID times in Argentina, the, it was, there was a huge program of uh, assistance from government uh, for people who didn't have formal uh, an informal employment uh, or, or a salary during COVID. So uh, 900 sex workers, female sex workers, registered uh, in just one day to receive such uh, help. And the feminist movement and the Ministry of Women say, no, no, uh, we don't recognize sex workers as having labor rights. So they eliminate them to the possibility of receiving those uh, funds. Only they could, have, have, they could have had access to those funds as victims not as workers who say we have rights, including the right to receive a compensatory uh, help when we cannot work because of the confinement measures. So that shows that uh, this, you know, the very paradox of this question of the political power, if you stand up as a subject of rights, this uh, system listens to you less as if you are someone or a group or an individual who doesn't uh, powerless. So uh, that is a paradox and even a double binding because it makes people insane. And just an anecdote that has nothing to do, but that, to, to, that shows this insane result of those discourse circulating. In Argentina, we have, as in other countries, a movement, an anti-political movement that conflated with the anti-vaccine anti discourse. And they say vaccines are poison, on the one hand. On the other hand, they say that people close to the government, close to the authorities, had privileged access to vaccines. So they say vaccines are poison and we want to have them at the same time. And they were in the streets claiming for against you know, corruption in access to vaccines and at the same time denouncing the conspiration of laboratories that wanted to poison us. So th that is the kind of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, insanity that this kind of this contradictory uh, and paradoxical discourse might produce in, in people, including all of us. Anna. Hello, yes. Um, just continuing on 
uh, talking about how the funding for civil society organizations has affected, for example, the work with women with HIV in Mexico. Um, when, when new liberal, not as Lopez Obrador is using it, but as we used it in the book, when new liberal policies were in place, um, uh, citizens as Uh, and uh, subjects of rights had to organize themselves in order to address the state, to have their causes be listened to. And that's where the language of the victim and the vulnerability comes about, sometimes in a very intelligent way, used strategically to be recognized in terms of their actual suffering and how to mobilize state funding for addressing that issue. But now it turns out that there are no organizations or no funding for, for organizations that would help, for example, women with HIV to be visible to the, to the state policy regarding HIV care. And for women in HIV in Mexico, it's very, very, very difficult to organize because HIV usually finds them at home. It, it turns out that uh, HIV prevalence is a lot uh, higher just among, uh, not, not prevalence, but um, women are getting infected more rapidly, united women, women who are married or who have a stable partner. They usually get the infection from their stable partners far more than sex workers who already have had in place some policies for them to have prevention. So HIV finds women usually in their home, caring for their children, maybe selling quesadillas on the street or doing some informal commerce and just being housewives, and they don't know each other. It's not like men who have uh, sex with men and men, uh, gay men who have HIV who already know the information and the prevention practices they could use in order to um, avoid HIV. Women don't. They're not considered risk uh, in, on risk of HIV because they are married. So marriage in this conservative, not in terms of Lopez Obrador, but in our terms, in this conservative thinking, women are not subject to risk because they're married. And monogamy is supposed to be the cornerstone of marriage. We know women tend to practice unilateral monogamy, but men don't tend to in Mexico, I would say, no? So um, what I'm saying is that um, instead of um, uh, looking for a way in which women could get together and organize themselves in order to access better health care in terms of HIV, what's happened is that not only that possibility is now uh, erased, but what uh, now the, the you can tell what, what the government is thinking, who is vulnerable to HIV. The real more vulnerable subject of risk of HIV is the unborn baby. So we only have a program for detection for pregnant women. So all women who are pregnant should, by, by order of the Ministry of Health, should get tested for HIV, only pregnant women. This doesn't mean that non-pregnant women can get detected. There is no program in place for them. So actually, pregnant women are, we are we've actually had more um, detected or diagnosed women than men in the last years. It doesn't mean that more women are getting infected than men. It means that more women, because of pregnancy care, are getting the test. And that's why they are being detected. But non-pregnant women who are married, who are you know, caring for their children, whatever, they tend to come with very um, untimely diagnosis and sometimes with AIDS. So what I'm saying is that who is vulnerable now, instead of when we wrote the chapter, it's just being reduced to the unburned infant.
Thank you very much. So one of the questions that we asked, and um, I'll just talk a little bit about my contribution to this chapter, and then ask anybody if you have anything to close up, and then we'll ask for questions from the audience, was how do you work around these paradoxes and double binds? And we drew together a, a number of threads that, again, came from these different um, uh, uh, frameworks that we were using. So we um, thought about the idea of a transversal politics in which we would draw together uh, different threads, including threads from different areas of the world that would not come into a coherent resistance or even a revolution if we're working in a situation in which anti-colonial revolutions have resulted in ongoing coloniality and perhaps neoliberalism could be the name of that ongoing coloniality, then simply a revolutionary politics would not work and yet we still argue in the book for fundamental transformation. Um, and so how do we make these things work? And this, the threads that we drew came from a number of different places from um, you know, queer theory, uh, Jose uh, Maya Horn was part of this chapter too and drew on Jose Esteban Munoz's early concept of disidentification as a way of moving around some of the blocks and paradoxes that we found. Um, uh, uh, women of color feminism, Chela Sandoval's idea of a differential consciousness and whether we could develop a differential practice where we were drawing together aspects of political practice that did not make for a coherent agenda, but nonetheless would allow people to move in ways that would both allow them to live, literally live with HIV, live in the face of COVID, live with the precarity of their economic situations, and yet could also contribute to um, uh, fundamental transformation. And now I wanna give a shout out to, I also, this crystallized for me over the summer. I spent the summer at uh, an NH summer seminar, and I think some of my friends from there are online, so hello. Mm -hmm. um, and I've worked with them a lot on the relationship between harm reduction, which we see in a lot of the practices that people have worked with in HIV AIDS and thinking about drug use and the like and fundamental transformation and thinking about Mario's problem of the way in which radical movements have been pushed to have to defend the state or electoral politics. Um, I began to think of this as a form of harm reduction. Like voting is just harm reduction. <laughs> and that we have to prevent the type of authoritarianism or in some cases outright fascism um, that people are seeing and um, to not do so would be to again leave people in their precarity to not deal with the state at all would be to abandon resources that might be available or simply to not try to prevent the harms of the state. Um, and yet we, a lot of the work that people were doing come from places that have autonomous movements that are developed outside of the state or even in response to COVID-19, the use of mutual aid and the like that are ways of building power and building power in ways that really transform relationships. Um, and to go back to the queer let's mess things up idea, which as you can tell, I'm fond of, is um, the idea that forming mutual aid and connecting that to social transformation is about forming different basic sets of social relations. So that the people you're looking to are not the family which is part of the nation. Um, and so part of what we tried to think about in the transversal idea was can we build even across our sites in order to have some idea of how to build political power where we would support each other. And some of that is literally through friendship as Anna was saying. Uh, some of that is through the sharing of knowledge. And as we traveled the world together, we also met with activists in every place that we went. Um, and tried to think about the ways that they were building power and how our analysis could be changed by that. So that's yeah, and the end, the end of the book. <laughs> yeah. All right, and we're kind of right on time. So we have about 15 minutes for questions. Colleagues, I call on you. Lisa Dugan. I can hear you like that. <laughs> <laughs> right, no. How about, does, that, yeah. does that sound different? Yeah. Okay, it's on now. So I have a broad, unanswerable question um, <laughs> that I think reflects this sort of historical moment of confusion that we're in, as well as in the personal confusion that I have. And that really has to do with, you know, encountering, as you, as you actually started out off by saying at the beginning, 
what do we do about this concept of neoliberalism now when we're undergoing all kinds of, of crises? And are we encountering something like a specter of fascism? And is then fascism a pre-neoliberal fascism? Are we talking about a neoliberal form of fascism? And so the, the question that I have really is, you know, if, if um, the continuity um, of racial capitalism and colonialism, right, cuts pre-neoliberalism, it cuts right through welfare state capitalism that tries to suppress the, the visibility of the colonialism and the, and the racial and the legacy of racial capitalism. And neoliberalism, the multicultural form, also tries to suppress it while at the same time, to using your term paradox, actually intensifies it, right? Neoliberalism is colonialism, as some of you said. But there's a way in which now the rise of pop, so-called populist nationalism is bringing the sort of colonial legacy and the racial capitalism into a huge, intense nationalist focus. And there's no question there are continuities with neoliberalism. Um, and that, um, but if neoliberalism is some kind of break that happens in the 70s, right? And the, the continuity before that is racial capitalism and colonialism. Are we at a moment where neoliberalism is breaking and we, we still have the continuity of racial capitalism, colonialism, which are in fact visibly intensified in certain ways, but is this something different? I mean, if, if neoliberalism has a beginning that breaks the continuity of racial capitalism, colonialism, does it have an ending? So we might be seeing the persistence of capitalism and the persistence of the legacy of colonialism, but maybe the end of this formation that we have called as a historical moment, uh, an, an end of neoliberalism, not capitalism. Because I think the terms neoliberalism and capitalism have been so intertwined in our analyses now that, that as long as capitalism is ongoing, we actually can't see that there's any kind of end to neoliberalism. But if we look at the beginning of neoliberalism as a break, which we do, all of us, right? We historicize the beginning. Well, I mean, it, there are continuities through it, but there's a moment where you use the term neoliberalism and you don't use it for the earlier period. Mm -hmm. Even though there are continuities, there still is a moment where we're talking about something called neoliberalism, which has a, has a history that's not exactly the same as the history. It's a moment in capitalism. It's not coterminous with it. So, so. I'm, okay, so as you can see, confusing, big, unanswerable question, um, <laughs> uh, which reflects, I think, where we all are as well as where I'm stuck in trying to think about the usefulness, whether the crisis in capitalism is some kind of endpoint for neoliberalism. Yeah, Elizabeth, you want to go first? And don't forget yours. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that question, Lisa, and um, for um, um, basically um, just summarizing um, many of the debates we had at the end. And so um, that's perfect. So here, like Janet often makes fun of me because often I'll, um, my way of resolving unresolvable questions like this, as I'll say, this is when I become a sociologist. Well, it's an empirical question. We'll see. Right? <laughs> let's you know. Let's see how it unfolds. But uh, you know, so that would be one way to answer it. But um, but. You know, here, here's what I personally think. I mean, I think you, you know, you know, I do think it's an empirical question, and we will see. And um, you know, what, you know, what just happened in Sweden and Italy, and uh, you know, in many parts of the globe. If this continues, then um, then we'll have to write a book about that, and we'll have to have a different title. I mean, that's true. But um, but I think you know, at this at this moment, for me at least, and I think for many of us, if, if, if I may, but we'll, we'll hear what you have to say. Um, but you know, in terms of the final con set of conversations we had about this. We kept neoliberalism um, for for um, for the reasons I think Mario touched upon, and I think and because the genealogy is important in terms of how we got here, right? In terms of um, how you know thinking about the pandemic moment and the pandemic mess and the mess of the pandemic response, neoliberalism was really um, a helpful way of thinking about um, global pandemic policy and neoliberalism. You know, I think is. Uh, you know, very important to understanding contemporary populist or authoritarian formations in terms of um, where they've come from and what people are responding to. And, um, you know, so I think that is the utility of it. And I would worry 
um, you, you know, if we were to abandon the term, that that genealogy would be lost, and um, and it's important to keep it in place so we know, um, you know, so you don't just have like a sort of liberal media version of oh, like the crazy populists and the tra crazy Trumpians, and it's just about. Um, you know, it's just about, you know, as, as if these reactionary formations um, came out of nowhere and couldn't be traced to other sets of policies that um, other more respectable political parties have been arguing for, fighting for, um, putting and keeping in place over, over many decades, right? So to keep the connections clear. So. Yeah, Anna. Um, well, thanks for the question. Of course, we are in the middle, you know, of a conversation uh, and in the middle of a confusion in, in the book. One thing we made, didn't say is that also we wanted to try to think and work not uh, neoliberally as we work today in the academia, tries to write collectively, not in a peer review chapter, uh, co-author everything and all that. But uh, I, I, in the relation to your question, I think I use the word fascist, fascism. I, I like the word even in Spanish, fachos, fascismo, because in the ordinary world, maybe not the, I come from political science, maybe it's not the technical word fascist, fascism, but in the ordinary way, everyday language that we use, we identify clearly, these people are fascist, we, we understand very well. But why, why this fascism might be neoliberal or be related to neoliberalism? I wrote three things. One is the, the direct, uh, um, I say, attack on sexual and gender issues to restore a patriarchal order, to put uh, everyone in place again uh, in terms of gender, sexuality, generation, race. That is a very, you know, this panic, this sexual panic or gender panic, yes, it's at the core of these new uh, uh, fascist experiences. Second, The, We're all this, older this, than when we first wrote the book. Yes, I, I'm a person in a presbicious, presbicious situation. Uh, the second question is that these new movements are very anti-state, anti-union, anti-corporations uh, in terms of organization of, 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 of workers. Uh, that they, are, they want to reduce taxes. They, they are, it's, it's not the same as the pre-welfare you know, welfare state uh, experience. They, they are very neoliberal in their claims uh, as the conservative experiences or neoliberal experiences from the 80s in the US or in Britain. And third and last, uh, they are neoliberal also because they put in this, at the center these small differences that someone who is underprivileged wants the privilege, privileges that for example, the marginalized or informal workers want the privileges that have the le uh, formal workers. And, uh, or women have privileges that men that don't have, or vice versa. But the structural, all in, uh, historical inequalities between capital and labor or whatever, they are invisible or untouchable. And these small little differences you see, uh, you know, informal workers saying public servants are privileged because they have, you know, stability and employment and salary, but they're public servants, they're, their salaries are nothing and uh, they are exploitative conditions of work, but these very petty differences are at the center of the, of the, of the conflict. So I, I might say, if I had to label those fascism, fascisms neoliberal, I say we, we, we wouldn't be so far for a uh, accurate characterization, even if we say we know that those terms are used for a lot of things. Ah. I wouldn't even think of trying to answer such a question, but I'm just thinking about what's happening in Mexico. Um, if neoliberalism has to do with um, uh, the, the state reduction, maybe, I don't know if that's the term, but with state reduction and privatization of health, um, of uh, state functions and all that. Uh, what I think we are seeing in Mexico is not that sort of thing that the neoliberals as insulted by López Obrador would say, 
but we are looking directly at state violence. It's just the state is taking care of the violence against the population. And um, this is not only an authoritarian turn, this is another way of thinking of, of about what the state altogether is about. Because just a couple of um, examples. Um, López Obrador has been the president, the most voted president in the history of Mexico. He, he was absolutely, like he won by far to the PRI and the PAN. Um, and now we realize that his most important ally is the army, is the armed forces. We didn't know that. Um, and this is very clear because he's, uh, they've increased the budget of the armed forces by 160%. Uh, in his in his um, in his office, no state agency has even had an increase of anything except the army. Now he uh, now there's been a new law in which the new liberals, as insulted, voted for with Lopez Obrador to bring the army into public safety public security. Um, functions. So there is no civil command anymore. It's a military command for both the police and the army. So what we are facing, nobody's talking about a coup right now, but what we are facing is actually uh, uh, um, the most voted uh, president in Mexico, the most elect, uh, democratically voted for, is giving the army unprecedented powers in the country. And um, um, there's some, he's also making the army not only, well, you know that there's officially accepted 100,000 missing people in Mexico. Many of that, of course, we don't really know, has been made by the army. And now the army is in the streets uh, protecting people, which is just, but, it's not only that, but he is making the army uh, an entrepreneur. They are now managing the new airport in Mexico City. And he has just, um, I think they, they, they've started speaking about the army producing cars. So is this neoliberal? I have no idea, but <laughs> there is, yeah, it is completely confusion. And there's no mediation between state violence and the population. We're just directly coming into, into that. That's great. Um, we're going to have to wrap up in a minute. So um, Kerwin and Tammy, I want to ask you if you have anything you want to add to this question or just final thoughts. What? Do, no, we, we're, supposed, we're already over time. Uh, um, yeah, I, I feel like I don't, I could, I, I, I'm in favor of whatever framing seems most politically useful, and I don't know what is most politically useful. So, um, but, uh, but I'll just make a small case for calling this, these, both of these forms neoliberalism. Um, but I'm not really com deeply committed to this <laughs> argument I'm about to make. But, um, but it does seem to me like, like the shift what I would term between neoliberal multiculturalism and neoliberal populism or fascism um, is a change in the hegemonic formation that is governing um, without, while primary structures or key structures within the, within the capitalist class are sort of remaining in place. So the WTO is still in place, the, you know, the, even what you're talking about Anna, in terms of like decimating the NGO field is like, very familiar to neoliberal policies of cutting off support for the poor and so on. So, um, you know, and, and increased militarization, increased securitization, all of these things are like familiar themes. And, and so um, even as um, the, the populist fascist elements are creating some, you know, very noticeable um, changes at, at, at some levels, um, they're, they're doing so in terms that, that 
um, that we've seen, I think, before. And, uh, you know, and I'm thinking of things at the border, like some of the stunts Trump pulled um, with border control. You know, I think he picks that in particular because it's a site where multicultural neoliberalism is actually in agreement with things that he did, just not so sensational, you know. And, and so there's just so much that continues, um, even as there are noticeable elements that change, of course, um, I guess I would, that's where I, I think of it more as a change in sort of Gramscian uh, hegemonic formation more than a change in capitalism. Although some of these other things that just got referenced like military getting involved in car making, I didn't know that, but, but you know, similar <laughs> things are happening in Egypt, right? And, and so, you know, um, you know, just, I don't know what to make of that. And Tammy, you can answer any question you would like. <laughs> oh, you get a last word. Uh, um, yeah, maybe not on that, but I, there's one thing that I wanted to, to, to say, which maybe brings us back to closer to the start of the, the conversation, because we were talking about some of the real vast and deep changes that we've seen over the decades since we started this project. One of the things that we talked about um, was clearly the pandemic, COVID-19. Uh, but one thing that we didn't get to kind of hold in the center in this conversation is thinking about, um, and for my, the area of the world in which I work and, and where my commitments lie, um, is the real drastic uh, changes that we have seen as a result of climate change. So I'm thinking about the 2017 hurricane season when, I mean, the historic back-to-back -back category five, I don't know how many people here are familiar with the way that, that NOAA measures uh, hurricanes, but um, there is no actual upper limit of, of the machines don't work after a certain point. Um, so we actually don't know the scale of those hurricanes. They went as high as they could record. Um, so in the space of a week and a half, um, the Caribbean was was battered um, by, by these historic storms from which they have not recovered. Um, so clearly that is a sort of pulling away of, of um, any kind of ability to, to survive. And at the same time, um, created space um, for venture capitalists to uh, come in and, and make, uh, in some places, very convincing claims for the need for privatization. So things like privatizing electrical grids and water supplies. Um, so all that to say, much has changed. Um, and I think it's important that we hold on to the differences across our spaces and the particularity of the histories and contexts. Um, and yet the results kind of are sadly often the same. And I think that's a great summary for the book. So um, first of all, I just want to thank our panelists. And I also want to thank you all for joining us in this experiment and uh, method uh, that we've been engaged in, but also in method of uh, talking with all of you through both coming in person. Thank you for being here in person. It's strangely, well, not strangely, but it's very moving uh, to see you all here and also to be with those of you who are on the live stream. So. Uh, thanks everyone and the conversation will continue.